Well, join me, if you would, in Romans, Romans chapter 13, as we continue walking through this powerful letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. I shared with you, I've been sharing with you all throughout uh, the circumstances of this letter. Paul's writing at a time where uh, the Jews uh, have been allowed to return to Rome. The Emperor Claudius had expelled them in 49 AD and uh, did so because of arguments, because of riots over Christus, over as in the Latin, but Christ, because of disagreements among the Jewish people. And the Romans never really understood Christianity. They saw it as a uh, they are, didn't understand it in the first century. They saw it really as just a, a sect of the Jewish faith, a sect of Judaism. And so they just lumped it all in with the Jews. They didn't understand why Gentiles or non-Jews were coming to faith or believing these things. But uh, they saw it as a troublesome matter. And so Claudius had expelled them. And now uh, later on, 52, 53 AD, they have returned uh, to Rome. And so Paul's writing a letter to the church. He's preparing them for his hopeful uh, visit there in Rome and and letting them know about his theology and encouraging them in some things. And so I'm going to start today by returning to a question that I asked you a few weeks ago when we were in chapter 12. And here's the question. How genuine is your love for others this morning? How genuine is your love for others this morning? I return to the question of love because Paul, here in chapter 13, returns to the command of love. In verses 8, 9, and 10, in verse 8 he says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. We need to realize that really love is the recurring theme of chapters 12, 13, and 14. And so we're going to have to keep talking about love because Paul keeps talking about love. In response to our salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are to become living sacrifices. You remember there's a transition that takes place when we enter into chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it calls us to be living sacrifices. In the first 11 chapters of Romans, it's all about how God brings us the gospel, what He does in, regard of the, in regards to the gospel. Beginning in chapter 12, it is our response to the gospel. 11 chapters of what God has done, and now what we are to do in response, and we are to, in, in response, become living sacrifices. What is a living sacrifice? Well, it's someone who commits their whole body, mind, and will to Christ and to His church. You can't love Jesus without loving His bride. And the bride is the body, the body of Christ. And so he begins telling us how we are to live within the body. He tells us how to live out the gospel as living sacrifices. In chapter 12, it's about sharing our spiritual gifts, not just You sharing your gifts, but you receiving gifts from others. Scripture says you need that. There are those who say, well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Well, to be a faithful one, you do. Because you can't share your gifts outside the body of Christ appropriately. Yes, we share our gifts in all circumstances, but many of those gifts are designed for use within the body. You also can't receive gifts from others unless you are a part of the body, unless you are actively involved in uh, the work of the congregation. And then we saw last week, the first seven verses of chapter 13, that we are to, as living sacrifices, submit to the governing authorities, whomever they are. We're to submit to that authority. And then in chapter 14, we're going to see that we're serving together in harmony. So in making each of these commands, Paul tells us why we should live this way. Why should we share our spiritual gifts? Why should we submit to the governing authorities? Why should we serve together in harmony? Because that's what love does. That's why. Because that's what love does. Why do you do you do certain things for your spouse? Why do you do certain things for your parents or for your children? Why do you do certain things for your friends and your family? Because that's what love does. That's what Paul is saying. The reason you share your spiritual gifts and receive those gifts in the same is because that's what love does. 
You've been given a spiritual gift. You're to use that spiritual gift. You're to employ that spiritual gift. You're to submit to the governing authorities, not because you agree with them, not because you like them, not because you accept them, but because that's what love does. You are to serve together within the body of Christ in harmony because that's what love does. We need to remember that Jesus summed up the whole law with two commands. They're real simple. Love God and love people. That's the commands that we've been given. Love God and love people. In Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and they gathered themselves together and one of them, a lawyer. Now, when you, when you see in the New Testament a lawyer, don't think of criminal law like in our land, but think of an expert in the Mosaic law. In other words, this is a member of the Pharisaical sect within Judaism, but he is a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he is an expert in the Mosaic law. Uh, so he's not just a Pharisee, but he is a, a top Pharisee, an expert Pharisee. And he asked Jesus a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, oftentimes when we think of that, we think of the Ten Commandments, right? We think of those ten as being the law of God. But I want you to know that the Pharisees had, had broken down, the rabbis over centuries had broken down the commandments of God, and not just in the Ten Commandments, but throughout the Old Testament and had identified 613 laws. And so here's the question. Teacher, of the 613 laws... Which is the great commandment in the law? Now, some suspect that this was an ongoing argument, that it was a discussion that the rabbis were talking about at that time, and that the lawyer, the expert in law, is actually asking a question that he doesn't know the answer to because it's one for debate. But here's the thing. They're testing Jesus. He wanted to test him. In other words, if Jesus elevated one law and disparaged another he would be suspect. There would be an opportunity for them to bring an accusation. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great commandment. He says this is the great commandment, the greatest commandment, the foremost commandment, the weightiest commandment, the heaviest commandment. But he He even says it's the first commandment, but he doesn't stop there. He could have left it right there. He answered the question, right? But the second, he says, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. He says everything boils down to this. Love God. That's the greatest. That's the foremost. That's the first. And love God. Others, love people. Love God, love people. He also gave us a new commandment that we love one another even as he has loved us and that by this love that we have for one another within the body of Christ, everyone would know that we are his disciples. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And so we are to love. Here in Romans 13, Paul has just called us to humbly submit to and support the governing authorities. In verse 7, he said, Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And if you think it's hard in the modern United States to do that, imagine being commanded to do that in the Roman Empire. Because as I shared with you last week, the emperors were evil individuals. I mean, Paul is writing in the context of Nero being the emperor. And Nero is going to turn on the Christian faith. He's going to persecute the Christian faith. In fact, he is going to be directly responsible for the martyrdom, the beheading of Paul who's writing this letter and says to submit to these authorities. And it didn't change as a result of his beheading. That was the command that he had been given. You see, Christians were opposed. They were persecuted by both the religious Jewish, I mean, the Jewish religious authorities and the pagan Roman authorities. Yet, Paul said, 
that we are to submit to them. We are to honor the governing authorities. We can only obey this command through love. I know that last week as I preached through those seven, chapters, those seven verses in Romans 13, several people either going out the door or texting me later in the day or talking to me through the week said that was a hard message to hear. There are some things I'm going to have to change. There's some things that have really confronted me about my attitude toward the election and my attitude toward those who are running and those things. And, and, and I haven't had a Christ-like attitude towards this. And, and so it's been very challenging. I don't know even how I can do this. The only way you can do it is through love. Because that's what love does. How can I love those who I disagree with politically? I mean, how can we be told to love our enemies? Love those who persecute us. The only way this can be done is through love. And that love must be extended to everyone. See, the problem that we have is we want to be exclusive with our love. There are only certain people that we want to offer love to. There are other people that not only do we want to not offer love to, but we want to avoid them altogether. We don't like them. In fact, there's some that we really loathe, despise, and hate. That's not what love does. And so here's what Paul tells us. Paul says that love is, first of all, the debt we owe. Love is the debt we owe. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. It is the debt we owe. Now I need you to understand something. I need you to understand that this is not a proof text against financial debt. It's been used as such throughout the centuries. I think I even talk about that in the Disciple Guide. uh, That that there are some, uh, some heroes of the faith. Uh, Charles Spurgeon included, that considered this proof text against financial debt. Uh, That's not what the text is saying here. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 verse 42 said, Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So it's not a... It, this, is, this, is, this has nothing to do, when, when Paul says here, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, he's not thinking in financial terms, he's thinking in spiritual and emotional terms. You know, if we have financial debts, then we should be faithful to repay them. We have a responsibility, we've made a commitment, we need to keep our commitments, keep our promises. But Paul is saying here that there is a moral debt that we can never pay in full. And that's the debt to love others. He says, you'll never be able to pay this debt in full. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. You see, we are indebted to love others because of Christ's love for us, which has been so lavishly poured out on us. We are so undeserving of God's love. Why why would we come? Why would I desire to be here every Sunday and to gather with the saints and to worship and praise his name because he loves me. Because I'm so undeserving of that love. Because there's no reason that God in his holiness, in his magnificence and in his might should ever love me. Yet he does. And he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son that if I would believe on him. I would not perish but have everlasting life. I am indebted forever to that lavish, glorious, wonderful, sacrificial love that Christ has for me. And the only way that I can even begin to repay his love is for me to love you. It's for me to love others and to do that daily. The reality is is I'll never be able to repay the debt that has been poured out for me. Christ's love for us is so great, so extravagant, that we must realize that our debt to Him is permanent. And it will never be repaid. Instead, it will always be owed. And so when you look at that person that you loathe, when you look at that person that you dislike, when you look at that person who has betrayed you, who has hurt you, who has done you wrong, you need to also look to the cross of Calvary. You need to know that it's your sin, that it's your iniquity that nailed him to that cross. And yet for the love that he has for you, he endured the shame and the agony and he died for you so that you might love 
others. Yes, even those who don't look like you, even those who don't act like you, even those who don't vote like you, even those who oppose you, who persecute you, who despise you. It is our responsibility to love because that's what love does and that's what love has done for us. Are you currently, let me ask you, are you currently delinquent in your debt and paying your debt of love to others? Are you behind in payments? It's a debt that you'll never pay off in full, but it's a debt that you owe. And we owe it daily. Are you delinquent in making those payments? Some of you are asking, I, I, they're just certain individuals, certain people. I just don't know how. I don't know how. I don't know how I can do that. Well, the payments are easier to make when love is the delight we live. It's the debt we owe. But it's easier to pay that debt when it's the delight we live. In the end of verse 8, Paul stated that he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And he says, for this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first commandments are about loving God and the remaining commandments are about loving your neighbor as yourself. There are two commands and all of the commands hang on those two. And so here's what he's saying, that if we genuinely love others like Jesus loves us, then we will not sin against them. Adultery, murder, stealing, coveting, they're all unloving actions and attitudes. In order to commit these sins, you have to act in an unloving way. You have to act in a way that is opposite, opposed to love. You see, love is the basis for all of God's commands. You can't keep God's commands apart from love. And this explains why the Ten Commandments aren't, aren't mentioned often in the New Testament. They don't need to be mentioned because all of the law hangs on two commands. Love God and love people. If you'll do those two things, then you'll keep the commands. Love covers them all. Love God and love people. Jesus said on these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. If you love your spouse and if you love others, then you will not commit adultery because adultery is the product of lust, not love. Murder is driven by hate, not love. Theft is driven by selfishness, not love. Coveting. Coveting is desiring what God has chosen not to give you. Think about that for just a moment. To covet is to want that which God has decided to not give you. And it's your lack of contentment with what God has given you. So it's not driven by love. But loving others is more than not just sin, not sinning against them. But loving uh, others involves looking for ways to bless them, looking for ways to minister to them. Paul wrote uh, in Romans chapter 12, and it's been a few weeks, so let's go back and look at that. It ought to be on the, uh, the, the page right before where you are. The next, or the, the, you might have to turn a page, but beginning in verse 9, when I ask you about loving genuinely a few weeks ago, He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil to, for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he ends that section by saying, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil 
with good. And I shared with you that verse in verse 20, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. It's not judgment that you're heaping on his head, but we believe that this harkens back to an Egyptian custom that those who were repentant would walk with coals on their head as a sign of their repentance. It's a, it's a, recon, it's a, it's a matter of reconciliation. It's, it's a matter of restoration. It's a matter of revival that we're talking about here. That's what love does. We're looking for ways to minister to others. We're looking for ways to reconcile with those who have broken relationships with us, those who have hurt us, those who have even persecuted us. As much as it depends upon you, live with, at peace with all people. In other words, don't hold anyone at arm's length. But rather, operate in love. Love them. Are you living your life in the delight of loving others? Even those who don't look like you. Even those who don't believe like you. Even those who don't vote like you. Jesus gives us clear instruction in Luke chapter 10 regarding who our neighbor is. In the same context of this conversation that he has with this lawyer, when Jesus answers the question and he says that, There are two commandments. The greatest of these is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer says, okay, good answer. But let me ask you, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus takes us an opportunity to tell him a parable. He said there was a man, a traveler, and he was on the road. And he fell among thieves and they beat him half to death and they stole all of his property and his possessions and they left him in the ditch for dead. And he says, a priest walked by, a Sadducee, a minister in the temple. And he looked at the man and he walked on the other side of the road. And he said, then a Levite walked by and he did the same thing. These were guys who were ministers in the house of God. These were guys who were responsible to the care and the ministry of the people of Israel. And both of them neglected this guy. Maybe it was for, so they didn't become ceremonially unclean. They said maybe it was because they were on their way to the temple and <clears throat> they had responsibilities there. And if they stopped and they helped this guy, then they would not be able to perform their duties at church. I've got to get to church. I've got a sermon to preach. I've got things to do. I've got other things to attend to. I can't see to the needs of this individual. And then Jesus said that this Samaritan came by. Now you've got to understand that in the hearts and the minds of the Pharisees, there was no more despicable people than the Samaritans. In fact, they hated the Samaritans more than they hated the Gentiles because the Samaritans were half-breeds. They were despicable individuals. That's why no one wanted to go through Samaria. And when Jesus said, I must go through Samaria, his disciples even questioned him and said, what would cause us to have to go through Samaria? You know, if we go through Samaria, we're going to have to interact with Samaritans. We don't talk to those people. We have nothing to do with those people. Yet Jesus had a ministry there. Later the church will have a ministry there. But Jesus said this Samaritan came along and he saw the man there in need and he cleaned his wounds and cared for him and he even picked him up and he put him on his own animal and he took him to an inn and he cared for him at the inn and he still was not well and so when he left he gave money to the innkeeper and said this is for his needs to care for him if it costs more than this when I come back by I will pay for it I will take care of it and Jesus looks at the teacher of the law the Pharisee and he says which one was a neighbor to the man who fell among thieves and the Pharisee couldn't even bring himself to say the Samaritan He didn't want to even use the word. He was so prejudiced, so bigoted, and so much hatred was in his heart towards that people group that he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, "Hmm, go do likewise. Go do likewise. You know why? (laughs) That's what love does. That's what love does. You call yourself a teacher of the law. You call yourself versed in the Word of God. You know the commands. Listen, they all hang on two. Love God, love people. Get those two right, you get it all right. Do you delight? Do you delight in doing it? You see, the Pharisees delighted in their knowledge of the law. They delighted in their practice of the law, but they didn't delight in the people that the law should have served. Love God, love people.
Because that's what love does. Love is the debt we always owe. But it must be the duty that we fulfill. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. In God's law, we see that we have a duty, a responsibility to cause no harm to our fellow man. And this is how love fulfills the law. Because love does no harm to a neighbor. In fact, it blesses. It seeks for opportunities to bless. Love encourages us and builds us up because love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and it is not arrogant. It does not act rude. It does not seek its own way. It is not easily provoked, which means it's not touchy. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love doesn't keep score. It does not rejoice or take pleasure in unrighteousness, but love rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never stops. Love is permanent. The love that God has for us is permanent. The love that we have for Him must be permanent, but it is evidenced. Through our love for others. I like how Peter summarizes this whole teaching with four short bullets in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17. He says, value all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. He sums up Paul's teaching in those four bullets. Value all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Are you fulfilling your duty this morning to keep the law of God by loving others? Are you doing well? Because that's what love does. Jesus said that the greatest two commandments are to love God and to love people. But these commands are not independent. In other words, you cannot keep one without keeping the other. If you're going to love God, then you must love others. And if you're not loving others, then you're not truly loving God. And I've seen this hypocrisy. See, Paul said in Romans 12, let your love be without hypocrisy. Here's the hypocrisy of the American church. The American church says, I love God, but I don't love you. Fill in the blank. That's the hypocrisy of the American church. To say that we love God, but yet there are people groups or individuals or people or whomever it is that we do not love. If you're not loving others, then you're not loving God. John writes to us in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 19. He says, we love because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now I challenge you, because some would say the same question that the lawyer asked Jesus, well, who is my brother? I think you'll get the same answer he got about the neighbor. This is not something to split hairs over. This is something to obey. This is something to live because that's what love does. Look, in this world of political division, in this world of cultural division, in this world of religious division, in this world of ideology divided, are you paying your debt of love? And are you doing it on a daily basis? Are you only loving those whom you would like to love? Aren't you glad that that's not how God loves Aren't you glad that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life? And if you're here this morning and if that applies to you, if you have received Him as your Lord and Savior and you claim to love Him, then are you loving others as Christ loves you? There are only two commands to follow here. All the law and the prophets hinge on those two. They're like hooks that everything else is dangling from. Love God, 
love people. Love God, love people. Not just some people. Not just the people we want to love. But all people. So that we might be living sacrifices before him. That's the only way that you're going to be able to obey the, uh, and submit to the governing authorities. It's the only way that you're going to be able to use your spiritual gifts and, and return those, receive those spiritual gifts from others. It's the only way that we're going to be able to, to walk in harmony as a body of Christ. It's the only way that we're going to be able to fi- fulfill the call of the gospel to be living sacrifices is if we love God and love people. Because that's what love does. So I invite you this morning to know that love. I want you to know that if you're here today and you're far from God, you're far from walking with Him, you're far from serving Him, you're far from feeling His love, I want you to know He loves you. I want you to know that He gave His Son on Calvary's cross so that you might have a relationship with Him, so that your sins might be forgiven, so that you who are unholy and ungodly and unrighteous might be made holy and godly and righteous through the sacrifice that was made for you. Your debt has been paid. Would you receive that gift of salvation this morning? We invite you to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We invite you this morning also, if you are a child of God, to partner with us here at Macedonia Baptist Church to join arms with us in doing the work of the ministry as living sacrifices that we might fulfill the work that He's called us to do together as one, that we might walk in that harmony, that we might share those spiritual gifts, that we might receive those spiritual gifts, that we might be blessed by Him as we bless one another. We invite you this morning to know the goodness and the love of God, but you cannot declare that you know the love of God if you're not walking in that love. Are you delinquent in your payments? Would you this morning make a commitment before the Lord? The altar will be open here in just a moment, but would you come and would you say, Lord, I'm behind. I'm behind in the debt I owe. And I want to start making deposits. I want to start making payments now. There are some people in my life that I have refused to love. There are some people in my life that I've withheld love from. There are some people in this world, Lord, that I don't, I don't want to love. But I can't imagine you wanting to love me. And I'm so thankful for your love. And so this morning, Lord, I repent. I ask for your forgiveness. I pray for you to cleanse me. And I pray for you, Lord, to pour out your love in me so that I might love others as you love me. So that the world might know I'm your disciple. Would you help me, Lord, not love with hypocrisy? But would you help me love genuinely this morning? To the glory of your great name. How would you respond? The altar is open, Brother Brian, and I'll be here at the front. But would you come this morning? I'm going to ask you if you would to stand. Would you come this morning? As we sing, as we praise Him, as we thank Him, as we glorify His name, would you this morning declare your love for God by committing to love people? In His name, you come as we sing.